Our special guest today is Ellen Coleman, who is the chairman and CEO of DuPont. Obviously, it's a company you're very familiar with. DuPont is a company that was, that's now 211 years old, started in 1802, and I think is the company that has been in the Dow Jones uh, uh, the longest for, of any uh, current company in the Dow Jones. The company today is, is a company with about $53 billion market cap, $35 billion in revenue, and about 65,000 employees. Uh, Ellen Coleman became the, the CEO of the company in uh, 2009, at, at, and, uh, in 2010, I'm sorry, and then she has been the chairman and CEO for several years now, been chairman, of CEO, chairman and CEO for, for several years. Uh, since she became the chairman and CEO, uh, the company's stock is up over 100 percent, and it's up about 25 percent this year. So she assumed her position as uh, chairman and CEO in both positions uh, as of January 1, uh, 2009, I should say. Uh, she has um, been at, G at, at the company for, uh, since 1988, uh, came there from GE. She started her business career actually at Westinghouse while she was in graduate school at, at Northwestern Business School, worked during the day and got her master's degree in business at night. Um, she did her undergraduate work at Tufts. Um, at, uh, when she joined DuPont, she had a series of positions and worked her way up to be a t president and then later a chairman and CEO. Um, earlier today, uh, uh, Forbes, magaz Forbes magazine and, uh, disclosed that uh, she's one of the uh, most highly regarded women in the, in the business world and uh, said that she is the third most powerful woman in American business. And, And she was also voted uh, one of the top 40 women in the entire world in terms of power um, by uh, Forbes as well. So uh, she's obviously a leader in the U.S. business world and a leader in uh, the global business world. And DuPont is uh, a company that is a global company, as you'll hear in a moment. So my pleasure to introduce uh, the chairman and CEO of DuPont, Ellen Coleman. very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. I am certain that when we scheduled this, we had no idea what was going to be going on in Washington this week. Um, but before we get into the conversation, I thought it was important for me to take a couple of minutes and talk about the punk company today. You know, David did express that we're 211 years old, but obviously a very different company today than then and have changed quite a bit in the last uh, decade. And I'm amazed as I go around and talk to people how when I describe the company today, they're surprised at the amount of change that's taken place in our company. So many people are surprised to learn that we don't sell nylon or polyester anymore. These are areas we pioneered. Um, However, we are one of the world's largest seed companies. Our materials are used in over half of the world's 400 million solar panels installed since 1975. We're a leader in biofuels development. And we make enzymes that are in much of the world's ice cream and other foods that you eat. So we're no longer the chemical giant, which is a term that is still used in many places in the media to describe us. Rather, we're combining biological science, chemistry, material science, and engineering to drive new growth opportunities. And from what we've seen, the most exciting changes in the world, science is going to drive at the intersection of these sciences. The biggest example, uh, the biggest advances and areas that really will solve some of the toughest problems that we face are going to come at the interface of biology, of chemistry, material science, and nanotechnology. So this is what I mean when I say and use the phrase integrated science. We believe it will be transfor uh, transformational for our company as this century continues to unfold. 
And we're using the power of integrated science to build our strengths in three areas. So if science is the what, where are we going to use it? The first is in agriculture and nutrition. We're already a major global player in agriculture, and our strategy is to extend that leadership across high-value science-driven segments in the ag and the food value chain. The second is in an area of bio-based industrials. Our, stra our strategy here is to develop world-leading industrial biotechnology capabilities to help transform new materials and new businesses that are bio-based. And the third area is in advanced materials. We've been a leader in material science for many years, and our strategy here is to strengthen and to grow our position in highly differentiated performance materials. Now, the key to success in these strategic areas will be our ability to create innovative solutions that respond to local needs. And this is occurring everywhere around the world, so where science meets demand. We've been open very much to working outside our company. It's just not the science we create, but we work collaboratively with others at every level so that the inventions in the laboratory become really answers and solutions for the world. Because the challenges we face, no matter where we are in the world, are very large and very complex. And I don't believe there's one company, one country, or one institution that has all the tools to help create those solutions. So to facilitate collaboration, we've built a global network um, to bring our science closer to local markets. And these are innovation centers, and each one of them allows our customers and other strategic partners to work with us to solve their problems locally. Now, at a DuPont Innovation Center, uh, partners of ours can connect with the more than 10,000 scientists and engineers in our company, no matter where they are in the world, to help create a solution or an answer, to create a new application, a new product, to help them be more successful. And of course, in only a few minutes, I can only scratch the surface, but I wanted to take the time to give you this overview so that as David and I are continuing our conversation and you hear me talk about soybeans or corn or cellulosic ethanol, you know that I'm talking about DuPont, but it's a transformed DuPont. So the bottom line is that our science and our markets are different, but our core values and our purpose as the company are the same. And really, it's the determination of our 65,000 employees around the world uh, that create this, and they're as solid as ever. We have an extraordinary set of scientific capability. We have tremendous insights into local markets, and we are very well positioned to continue to use this science to create solutions that make people's lives better, creating value for our customers, and our shareholders. Well, thank you very much, and I look forward to our dialogue. Thank you very much. So um, let me start by asking, do you think uh, for a, a woman to become the chairman and CEO of a Fortune 50 company, does she have to be twice as smart as a man or just one and a half times as smart? Well, I, I'm not sure what the IQ uh, uh, needs to be, but I think it's based on the fact we multitask. We get so much more done than the guys do. Okay. I, I really do think that's okay. the... Okay. So when you, you uh, worked at Westinghouse and then General Electric, in 1988 you came over uh, to... Uh, DuPont, and you're from Wilmington, so was that a factor in wanting to go back to the, a company based in the state that you were born in or raised? Was that a factor or not? Well, you know, I, um, I was married. My husband and I um, had lived in Connecticut with GE, then in Milwaukee, and um, we wanted to get back to the East Coast. And, you know, the amazing thing to me is, uh, is DuPont at that time um, had more than 50% of their business centers were located in Wilmington. My husband's an engineer and an MBA as well, and he and I both worked in the company. Uh, he retired earlier this year, but he and I both worked in the company and never ran into each other for the first seven years at the office. 
Wow. So, you know, we could both have great careers and, and continue to do things we were interested in and see each other right. at night and the weekends. So um, when you became, uh, when you joined from, from General Electric, did you actually think it was realistic that a woman could uh, become the CEO of that company or any large company of that type? Yeah, I, don't, I don't think back in 88 that was the, the dis discussion. I mean, it, um, I had just graduated from grad school. M my goal was to be a marketing manager in a high-tech company. I, I failed. Right. Um, I don't think DuPont would be considered in the tech world. Um, but, you know, I, where I found my passion at DuPont, and the reason I stayed 25 years, is I started wandering around in the laboratories. Uh, I was working in, in one of the businesses and met our research and development folks and started wandering the halls, fig finding out what they were working on. And I really felt as an engineer with an MBA, my passion was how to connect that science to the marketplace to really help our customers succeed and hence DuPont succeed. And I got very excited about what I found and just really had a great time uh, working in different businesses and DuPont in my career doing okay. just that. So when you became the CEO, um, and DuPont is obviously the biggest company in Delaware um, and obviously employs a lot of people in Wilmington and so forth, did all of a sudden a lot of people call you up and said, I knew you in high school, I didn't realize you were going to be CEO, and you got oh, a lot yeah. of new friends and new well, there relatives. There were several teachers, yes, that, uh, right, right. that did connect. They said they knew you had it in you and that kind of thing. Um, well, apparently I was highly, I've always been somebody who's been, you know, had a high bar, got things done, focused on how to, how to win. I was, played basketball in high school and college, and um, really? yeah. So you, you went to Tufts? I did. And you played basketball there? I did. Any scoring records or? Yeah, <laughs> I could out jump six footers. Really? Let's just say wow. that. Yeah. Okay. So you didn't consider a career in professional basketball? No, 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 but not, no. I, I really uh, focused on engineering. I really okay. felt that was a better path for me. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, it seemed to have worked out. So when when you became the CEO, uh, it was there was a free fall in the U.S. economy at the time, and we were in a terrible uh, financial meltdown. Were you worried? about uh, your ability to engineer earnings increases and so forth yeah, at that time? You know, we had a couple of things. Number one is that I, you know, in the last couple of years before I became CEO, as I, you know, was um, taking on more responsibility in the company, I realized I had maybe an opportunity to lead the firm. And so I had a plan. I had, gee, if the board ever called me and said, you know, what would you do differently? I, I had plan A. And the hardest thing I had to do was open the drawer and put plan A in it and close the okay. drawer and create plan B. Because the world was changing so quickly, it was a very different place. And you had to work your way through the financial crisis. We had to generate enough cash to pay our dividend, to continue to invest in the research and development, which we thought was key in differentiating us from our competition coming out of it. We really had needed to create operating leverage so that when the economy uh, returned, we could, right. um, you know, continue on our path to transformation. So do you get irritated or upset when people say DuPont is a chemical company? Because I thought of that as a chemical company for a long time. Because you pointed out it's really not a chemical company so much as a science company. Or do you just say, let me explain what the company does yeah, now? Yeah, no, I don't get irritated. I, it, I use that as a, a, an avenue to tell our story to talk about how we have really utilized, chemistry is really important. In chemistry and biology and nanotechnology, it, it, you know, when you work across those sciences, you can create great opportunities, uh, whether it's a novel insecticide that's uh, friendly to humans and can be used in small quantities and very efficacious. I mean, just changing uh, the whole point there. I mean, materials that protect um, you know, firefighters, it, that much lighter weight, more flexible. I mean, so science can create a lot of, of positives right. for our, comp our customers down the value chain, and I think that's where the focus is. So some of the products are well known. You have, how many products do you actually manufacture? I've and, never counted, but, but, but I know in the last, what, four years, uh, about 29% of our revenue is from products. Last year, 29% uh, of our 2012 revenue is from products that were introduced in the last four years. There's about 10,000 of those. Wow. 
And that's innovation, and it's science, and it really is advancing, whether it's in agriculture, nutrition, uh, bio-based industrials, or in advanced materials. Well, let me mention two products that are per probably pretty well known. One is Teflon. Uh, DuPont invented Teflon. Yes. Is that right? Now, how does that actually work? Explain it's Very that. low coefficient. <laughs> so, where's my board? If I need a whiteboard, I can draw it for you. Very low coefficient of friction. So, and, and, but you know, the hardest thing about te Teflon is not about things not sticking to it. It's about getting it to stick to something that you want it to. So you think about whether it's a frying pan or a pipe in oil and gas where you don't want stuff to build up. We have to figure out how to make something that nothing sticks to stick to something. So okay. that's right. quite an engineering challenge. Okay. All right, and let me ask you another one, Kevlar. Kevlar is something that's thought to be very important. It's in, uh, let's say, chest protectors and other things. How does Kevlar actually keep a bullet from yeah, penetrating? Yeah, Kevlar is everywhere, and, um, and it's in life protection, so uh, military and first responder vests. It, it dissipates energy. So Kevlar has the ability to absorb energy and dissipate it out so that a bullet then flattens and the energy gets dissipated across the chest or wherever, helmets. Um, it's very tough and very lightweight, and it's used in a, you know, like hockey sticks. The, the, they're used in hockey sticks so they don't break when Actually, they're being used. And, so um, very often uh, large companies have uh, R&D operations, and they say to their scientists, we want a product that does something like along these lines, and some other companies say just put the smart, smart scientists together and they will come up with something that might ultimately be useful, but we don't, won't know it originally what they're going to come up with. So how do you do that? Do you say to your scientists, come up with a product that will solve this problem, or do you say, think of uh, something that you think is interesting and maybe something good will come from it? So, you know, it's an and equation, right? So the first thing is, is that the process of innovation has changed greatly over the last few decades. And it used to be in the 40s and 50s, we would invent it, throw it over the wall, what could the marketers do with it? Now it's an integrated process. It starts with uh, our customers, no matter where they are in the world, in these innovation centers, right. connecting into our scientists or engineers or whatever they need. It's, it's a very collaborative process um, and inclusive. And, um, and it's through that kind of breaking down the barriers between us and our value chains and our customers, we learn a lot about from them about not only the functionality of the product but also how to make it run better in their in their right. manufacturing process that can create productivity for them and so it's a it's a greatly collaborative and inclusive process today and very very different than the past and that enables us to create those new products to generate yeah. Top line growth and bottom line growth for our company. But your job is to say to a scientist, I have an idea and go see if you can make it work. I mean, you're not, you're not the person whose job it is to come up with scientific uh, breakthroughs that they are going to go try to figure out if they can make it work. I and mean, that's not the CEO's job, right? You don't no. tell them what to do. And well, they if just... I have an idea, I'm more than willing to share it with them. But okay. I can tell you. <laughs> well, when you, when you say to somebody, come up with a product along these lines, I assume they're probably responsive, but no. You know, it's, it creates an interesting dialogue, and, okay. and you know, for, for one thing is that we, um, so we do basic research, and we do applied research and development, and all the way down through product introduction and manufacturing, and so, you know, it's interesting, because some of the most novel things that we've come up with, I went, to, I remember going to our uh, chief technology officer, this is about four years ago, a woman by the name of Uma Chowdhury, and I said, how did this product come to be? It opened up a, a new market for us in China that we couldn't address economically with right. the historic products. And she said, I wish I could tell you there was a recipe. These two guys ran into each other in the cafeteria. They hadn't seen each other in five years. They sat down and started talking, right. and a new product was born. One was working on a need in an area, and the other one said, have you ever thought about doing A, B, and C? And they got together and worked on it, and a new product was launched. And so, you know, you can't schedule innovation, right. but what you can do is create the opportunity for those things to happen. So you mentioned China, and I guess that leads to the question of overseas and international operations. Today, you have about 65,000 employees. How many of them are in the United States? About half. Half. And of uh, those in, in, in Delaware, about 10,000 or so? Yep. And of the ones overseas, do you, do you have more revenue from overseas? There's mm -hmm. about half, is, half the revenue is no, from overseas? No, 60% of our revenue is from outside of the U.S. That's and like, Canada. Okay. And today, um, as you look at the government shutdown that we're living through, how is that affecting DuPont? Is it 
you know, doing something dramatically bad to you, or you're not being affected by that by it that much, or what? You no, know, I think we're seeing the slowdown. I mean, it started with sequestration, right, with limited budgets from a military or or uh, other areas, because we do sell product to the to the government. My biggest concern is the economic slowdown that is occurring and will occur the longer this goes on. Right. It will impact the U.S. economy. People, you know, lack of confidence is one of the major issues we have today, and I think we need to get after that. So you're in Washington today, obviously. I suppose the president called you up after this and said, come on over, I'd like some ideas from a business person about how I could solve this debt problem. Uh, what would you tell him he should do? Well, I mean, I'm an engineer, you're the economist, so you okay. probably have right. more ideas than that. You know, I, you know, when I think of some of the problems that we face in, in business, we focus on creating the answer, but then we, afterwards we go to root cause and say, how do you fix the process? I see so many people today trying to focus on who's at fault as opposed to focus on what we need to do to go forward. So I'd ask for the conversation to look forward and say, what do we need to do to make this better? And we can always figure out how, um, how we improve our process in order to have this not happen again. So if the president said, OK, I, I take it you don't want to give me advice, but I need a senior cabinet officer at some point or some future president, would you ever go into government in a senior position, or you, you've had enough of? I, I have a reputation for speaking my mind mm -hmm. and not being yes, able thanks. to control that many times. And so it okay. probably wouldn't be a good career okay. choice for okay. me. OK. <laughs> so um, let's talk about China for a moment. You mentioned earlier. Um, do you see it as the great growth engine for your company in the sense that it's a gigantic emerging market and a lot of American companies are trying to sell a lot of things there? Or is that a great prospect for you or not as important as other markets? No, we've been there a long time um, and we continue to grow there. It is about um, that they have markets that are opening up and allowing more innovation from the outside to come take a position. And, you know, we're going to be part of that, in, in, whether it's in agriculture, in, in food ingredients. You think about the stress of 7 billion people in the world going to 9 billion people, and a lot of those people are not going to be in the United States and Western China, the growth. The growth is coming from the developing world. And you think of moving from a rural food system to an urban food system, and the issues you get there not only with, uh, with, with uh, the waste that's occurring in the value chain, the need to grow more food, packaging materials. Uh, it's about the nutrition of the food, not just the quantity. And you see a lot of change taking place in places like China, in India, in ASEAN, in, in, in other places in the world. So that creates opportunity. And so we leverage our global science to create very local solutions to be, to be relevant there. In the food area, you've become a major um, producer of food seeds and other kinds of agricultural products. Can you explain what the concern is about genetically modified food products? Uh, do you think it's a legitimate concern, and how do you try to address that concern? Well, you know, I think that any of us as individuals or countries need to be able to choose how science impacts us, and uh, countries need to choose from a regulatory environment where they set that bar. I think it needs to be done from a scientific framework, not an emotional framework. Um, I'm very comfortable with the technology. Um, I, uh, you know, it is one of the most studied technologies between EPA, FDA, and the various regulatory regimes around the world. But I'm very clear that, that um, we as individuals and we as a country need to make that determination. Now, I'm a big believer that science is becoming a bigger part of all of our lives, not a smaller part. And we're not doing our job as a country in educating our children to be able to right. live in a world where they need to make these decisions, and they need to do it from a base of knowledge. And I think you know, the work that's been be being done around improving the curriculum in STEM, right. in science-based areas, is critical to our future. You have three children. Have they followed your advice? Are they going into these areas? Or are they getting educated in those areas? Two, two out of three. So I, That's not you bad. Know, so far. So two are still in college in engineering school. Okay. So today, um, as you look at DuPont, um, do you see it as a uh, company that is helped by being based in Delaware or hurt? Or it makes no difference? In other words, it's a small state, some might say. Um, and, and uh, it's a state that isn't the center of the financial world the way New York is. 
but do you see it as a plus or a minus, or it doesn't yes. make a difference? Well, strategically located between Washington and New York, what else could be more perfect okay. than that? All right. You know, I, you know, for any business leader today, what you need access to is transportation. You know, and you need to be close to whether it's rail or air, because I spend more time out of the headquarters than I spend in the headquarters, because it is about connecting to the customer. It's about walking our laboratories um, around the world. It's about sitting with farmers in India, or a couple of weeks ago I was up in north, northeastern China with farmers and understanding what changes are occurring in that value chain and how do we need to change to address that. So access to a good airport and I'm fine. So do you spend uh, your travel time, are you out of the United States uh, a large amount of your travel time? Is that where, because your customers are out? Outside or? Yeah, about half my travel is outside the U.S. Okay. And then today, um, you know, if you were to say to some people, you were to speak to people at a business school or an engineering school, come work at DuPont, what would be your argument why they should come to DuPont as an exciting place to have a career? That's, that, to me, that's the most exciting part of my job is I do spend time chief recruiting officer and I go out to okay. engineering schools and I go to places because we recruit PhDs and engineers and scientists. And what I say is, with the changes that are occurring in the world, and the need for science to address that change, feeding a growing population, you know, energy choices for that growing population, and protecting people in the environment, they're the areas that DuPont is focused on from a science standpoint. And working with customers focused on that and understanding how it creates a huge difference in our world and the impact that science can have. Because kids today, they want a good job, but they want to work for somebody that also does good. And they have choices. You know, I'm, I recruit a lot of engineers, and there's a lot of, you know, engineer unemployment is at the lowest of any different uh, group in the United States these days. So it is. People, young kids today, have a passion for helping the world become a better place. And I talk about the impact that DuPont has had and the impact we will have in the future. So from the time somebody in your labs comes up with a new idea till it becomes a product, is that a typically a multi-year period of time? And how do you eliminate the a bureaucratic a tendency to slow things down when you're trying to get new products to the market? You no, know, it, um, so we measure it, right? We measure cycle time. And it's different in every industry. In automotive, it'd be three to four years. In agriculture, if it's seed, it could be 20 years. Um, and, you know, I'm the beneficiary of the decisions my predecessors made in terms of where to focus our science and technology. And they created um, innovations that we are introducing this year and next year that are helping us grow. Okay. And, um, and I focus on, you know, we've done a lot. We've increased our research and development um, budgets quite a bit over the last five years since the global financial oh. crisis. And we measure it. Uh, we measure its impact on our new products, on our top line growth. Uh, we, you know, it's interesting because what you want to do is, is if you're not going to be successful, you want to fail quickly and you want to fail cheaply. And you have to make it okay for people to do that and you have to honor the learning from that. And so I spend a lot of time in our labs. Okay. So how many people, I'm just curious, how many people here think that they've used the DuPont product today? Um, okay, all right. And how many people here actually understand how Teflon works? <laughs> okay, okay. My senator does. Okay. It's a proud moment. So, uh, well, so today, um, as you look at the competition, do you see the greatest competition, DuPont, as a uh, company from uh, other companies in the United States or from companies overseas? Do you see, uh, where do you see your beta biggest competition coming? Yeah, I think the most of our competition is coming from emerging markets as their companies create um, and continue to grow and evolve. And we've been dealing with that, I mean, for decades. Um, but, you know, the interesting thing is that um, it, competition is good, right? I think competition is good for the economy. I think competition is good for us because it keeps us on our game. It keeps us focused on what's important, on how to continue to create innovation that makes a difference to our customers. And then not only we as a company uh, create value, our shareholders participate in that. And I think of that as great. I love, um, you know, well, the basketball player in me comes out. You know, I love the nature of competition. And really winning in the marketplace is what it's all about.
So uh, today, when you are um, worried about being the CEO, you have to deal with uh, increasing quarterly earnings every quarter. Um, is that uh, something that you're worried about? Because you're, the focus in America on uh, quarterly earnings increases, is that something that you have to deal with all the time? Or you just let the earnings go where they're going to go? Or do you, you spend a lot of time making sure that you know, your earnings are going to go up? Uh, how, how do you try well, to manage Well, I think the goal that? at the end of the day is for it to go up, right? right. And there's a lot of things that impact that. Um, so yeah, so you have to meet your short-term commitments, and you have to m make sure you have a long-term plan that takes you in a direction right. that continues to create the opportunities right. that allow you to make those short-term commitments. So it, what keeps you up at night? What are you most worried about, both as a CEO of DuPont and as a, an American business leader? What are your biggest you know, concerns? I, so if you look at, at what's happening here in Washington, you know, it's it's just the tip of the iceberg in many ways. We have to deal with it. But the creation of an appropriate regulatory regime, tax regime, to help U.S. companies compete in a, in a global economy is really important. And you know, we work on that in a lot of different venues and make sure our voice is heard. Um, but I think that is the most important thing, because to create a strong, vibrant U.S. economy um, is, you know, needs to have the regulatory, the tax, in an appropriate place to allow us to compete, not just in the U.S., but compete globally. So do you spend a lot of time in Washington with regulators talking about environmental concerns or other kinds of things? And how have you dealt with the environmental concerns that some people have had about chemical companies? Has that been a big problem for you? Well, I think we've dealt with it very, um, you know, upfront and over decades. You know, I mean, my, one of my predecessors, um, Ed Woolard, deemed himself the chief environmental officer. And really, this was back in the 1980s and created us on a pathway around sustainability, footprint reduction, right? And then not only that, but how do our products make a difference to help other companies um, be better from a sustainability standpoint? For instance, advanced polymers today take much higher temperatures, more highly corrosive environments than they ever have, enabling automotive companies to lightweight vehicles. These, these diesels they have in Europe, very hot, very corrosive. Polymers are replacing metals to allow light weighting, to allow increases in fuel economy. So everybody wins, right? And so focus in those areas. So not only do we look at it from an environmental footprint reduction, we look at how our products can help down our value chains to create a more, more sustainable future right. for our world. In terms of future opportunities, let's suppose someday you might leave as CEO someday, way down the future, and somebody came to you and said, uh, here's a billion dollars to invest as a private equity investor, invest in some area you think is very attractive, where there's going to be growth opportunities. <laughs> where, where would you, where would you well, put gee, that money? Well, let me think, David. Let's talk about this. You know, I tell you, I, um, a decade ago uh, or more, 13 years ago, I started working in the laboratories and understanding the power of biotechnology to really change the material world. It, it's done a lot in pharmaceuticals, it's done a lot in agriculture, um, but it's changed in the in materials world. I think we're just at the beginning of that transition. I think that raw materials coming from biologic sources, from cellulose, from waste, um, is going to create not only um, more sustainable materials that we know about today, but new and different materials that are going to enable a whole different future going forward. So I'd pick that area. So you would. Okay. And do you think that uh, other countries are competing uh, more favorably against us than we would like? In other words, do you see China being able to make investments in this area better than we are, or, or do you not worry about our competitive abilities? Yeah, I think this is an area where we're just at the beginning. And so there are a lot of little companies, a lot of entrepreneurs that are out there that are doing some very interesting things. We probably have the largest base of science in that area. Uh, a lot of it homegrown, some of it we've purchased um, from the outside. Um, and I do think, getting back to uh, the issue of collaboration, that it's not going to, we alone aren't going to get there, it's by partnering. Like we're partnering with BP on butanol which is a, um, an a energy, uh, so we replace uh, ethanol, but doesn't have the energy degradation, doesn't have the issues in moving through the pipelines. And so, and there's a lot you can do in those areas, but it takes partnerships, and it's gonna take working across those boundaries to really get right. it done. Now, who is the person who thinks of these names of the products, the 
Teflon or Kevlar? Who, who is, do you have a person who's job is to come up with these names? Yeah, I do or think, that yeah, that wouldn't be me. I tried. They don't let me. But um, I do think we let the scientists, you know, kind of have a, a say in it. Now, I, you know, honoring our scientists in that way is great. Uh, Renaxipure, the insecticide I spoke about earlier, uh, zero sales five years ago, 750 million last year. The name hasn't seemed to slow down its success. Right. Uh, in the marketplace, so uh, so that is a. I'll take that back and find out exactly who named that one. Okay. So ultimately, as the CEO, you will at some point down the road, perhaps step down, do something else. Um, is there any career ambition you have other than running a large company like this? And presumably, you don't want to go into government. And I don't know if you want to go into private equity. You're always welcome, of course. <laughs> but. Um, is, is there anything that you would like to see as a professional challenge that you, ahead of what you're doing now? Yeah, you know, I, I tell you, what my, where my passion lies is in science education. It's in creating more engineers. Uh, it's creating more scientists. And I think, we, you know, I spend a lot of time uh, working to change the equation, which is a, a, a bunch of CEOs uh, with the business roundtable, a bunch of CEOs working together to see how our efforts can help create a stronger scientific future in our educational system. So that's an area of passion of mine. And I think what it comes back to is how I kind of grew up in business. Grow, I grew up, you know, as an engineer with a, with a MBA, but connecting science to the marketplace. And I think that's really where I get excited and where I love to spend my time. And so your legacy, not that you're leaving, but what you would like to see uh, people say about what you've done for DuPont um, is what, that you've transformed it from a certain type of company to a different type? What would you like people to say as of now that you've done to effectuate change? You know, it's interesting. I do think it is around transformation. I mean, we're in our third century. Uh, we moved from an explosives company to a chemical company. We're now moving into the integrated science company and really creating um, great products and services down our value chains to enable our customers to be successful using all the power that science has. And it is that transformation and that broadening um, that is really uh, driving me, it's driving my senior team and creating the growth, both top line and bottom line for our company. And uh, today, would you say that uh, DuPont is as strong as any time you've been in the company and you're very happy with your prospects going forward? Or what is your biggest concern today for DuPont? Well, I think for any CEO, you, you're never satisfied with where you are. You're always looking to where you can go. You know, uh, hold the bar high, make sure we have the right people and the right jobs to really continue to drive the change. Uh, you know, I, I'm very proud of the work our team has done since the global financial crisis. I think we've performed very well. And I think we have great opportunity in front of us. And I think that really, uh, that kind of uh, creates the morale and the drive and the motivation for our teams around the world to continue to connect our science to the marketplace. So if a woman today is watching this interview, or she maybe is in the audience, and she's an MBA student, and she wants to become the CEO of a Fortune 50 company herself, what are the one or two things you would say that she should do, other than being smarter than a man, perhaps? But what would you say is the, the qualities that, to rise to the top that one needs? You know, so each of us has what I call the book on us, how people view us from the outside. And, you know, so what's the book that makes a good CEO, right? It's, you have to be smart, certainly, but you have to be able to bring people with you. You have to build strong teams, get people to work together, give them a, a compelling vision of where to go. So. It is the EQ as well as the IQ, but build a good book on you. What do you want to be known for? Getting things done, working across complex environments and creating a future. And so I think that part of it and whatever, I mean, I think the wonderful world we have today means people can choose you know, where they go and how they engage. And so do that perspectively, not just looking in the rear view mirror. So how do you stay in touch as a CEO of a large company with, with the average person, their interests? So do you go shopping in supermarkets yourself and do people recognize you because you are famous in Delaware and other places, but how does that get done? Yeah. So you yes, my children did need to eat and still do. Um, and yes, I was part of that. So I mean, the, the interesting thing is the biggest shock to our employees in the Wilmington area was when they would run into me. On a, on a Sunday afternoon in the supermarket, 
um, in the mall. I mean, I was literally two weeks ago, I, I needed to pick something up really quick. So like eight o'clock at night, I run into the mall to get something. I'm walking out, this woman stops me and says, you do your own shopping? <laughs> and I went, yeah. And she goes, I work for you. I said, I figured that out. And so we, you know, and, and so, because um, nobody else usually Thanks. stops me. Um, and so I said, so where do you work? And so we had a great conversation, very quick conversation. Um, but people are shocked that I, we all, you know, live life the same way, right? Okay, so you're very happy with where you are today at DuPont, and you're very uh, satisfied with uh, your career to date, I'd say. Was there one goal that you have that you would say is the goal you have ahead of you in the next three or four years or so? You know, I, um, I have a, a, a dream of where our company is going and a view to that uh, that we're d driving to and delivering on every day. And I, you know, I have a great team and we know what our vision is and where we're headed and, you know, we spend a lot of time out in the marketplace listening and, you know, anybody who deals in this position, you're doing it from a labor of love because there's no other reason to do it because, you know, it's, as you know, it's fraught with a lot of, of issues. And so I really think that the continued transformation of our company and that integrated right. science in these areas is phenomenally exciting to me. It's exciting for our people. And we're going to, you know, it's funny. We just, we kind of, all of us in the company consider ourselves a community of solvers. So we're there to help solve issues down our value chains in the marketplace. I've walked farms in sub-Saharan Africa and in China, and the issues, many of them are the same, many of them are different. And how do we help translate and have science make a difference in those areas? It's very exciting. And being a basketball player has given you a competitive uh, drive, I'd say. Would you say being a basketball player is probably helpful to what you did? Well, I do think competitive sports does create a set of skills in teamwork, a set of skills in that the results do matter. Um, and, and a sense of camaraderie and loyalty to each right. other that creates great, you know, great results. The team creates great results. And I think that's helpful to any of us as you work in this environment. Well, and one last question. How did you get the stock to go up 119% since you've been the CEO <laughs> and 25% this year? Um, I'm looking for advice on how to Wait. do something like that. Yeah, okay. Um, so, um, <laughs> you know, it's interesting. It's, uh, we focused on what we could control. We went to our shareholders and said, we're not going to cut our dividend. We're going to pay you the dividend. We looked across our company and said, we're going to focus on research and development. We'll be successful coming out of this crisis by creating new innovations and products that, are, that our customers want and need better than the competition. And you give people a really clear sense of purpose and drive coming through the financial right. crisis, and they just ran for it and, and delivered on it greatly. And I think we just continued to drive and deliver in that fashion. Well, thank you for a slam dunk interview, and I appreciate <laughs> it very much. Thank, thank you. you.